Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Thomas Anglican Church on the second Sunday uh, of the Easter season. It's great to be with you in worship today. Uh, if you would, let me join me in standing as you're able, and we'll begin with our professional hymns. Thank you. 
you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the pastoral mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by faith. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Uh, you can be seated for the reading. I've also been asked to let you know someone with a blue Subaru uh, has the lights flashing on your car. Blue Subaru, lights flashing, uh, we'll attend to the word of God. Our Old Testament reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 26. Verses 1 through 9 and verse 19. And that day, this psalm will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city who sets up salvation as walls of the Lord's. Open the gates that the righteous nation who keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. For he has humbled the inhabitants of the high, the lofty city. Lays it low, lays it low to the ground, cast it to the dust. The foot tramples it, the feet of the poor, the steps of the needy. The path of the righteous is level. You make level the way of righteous. In the path of your judgments, O Lord, we wait for you. Your name and remembrance are the desire of our soul. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust awake and sing for joy. For well, your dew is a dew of life, and the earth will give birth to the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Psalm for today, Psalm 111. We'll read this responsibly by half verse. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks unto the Lord with my whole heart. The works of the Lord are great. His work is worthy to be praised and held in honor. And his righteousness endures forever. He has made his marvelous works to be had in remembrance. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He has given food to those who fear him. He shall never be mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works. That he may give them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are true. They stand fast forever and ever. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all of those who live accordingly is praise and yours forever. Say together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Overcome the world, our faith. 
Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my fingers into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Let us pray. Lord, we ask now that you would be with us. Lord, we ask now that you would guide our hearts. Lord, that you would guide the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, that they would be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to begin today by reminding a lot of you of something, uh, something that might not be the most pleasant memory. It happened in high school, maybe in junior high if you went to a really sort of eager high school, but somewhere around there, you were probably assigned a book to read. A book about a young boy who, who grew up in poverty, who was raised by his, his controlling and overbearing sister and his doting brother-in-law. A book about a boy who suddenly finds himself the subject of great expectations. <laughs> now listen. You may have been assigned a book, you may not have. If you're like me, being assigned a book doesn't necessarily mean that you read it. I think, I, I think this is a safe place, we can admit that. Um, and if you read it, you may have hated it. All of that is okay, none of that really matters for today. The reason I bring it up is because there's a character in that book that exemplifies the modern life. His name is John Wimmick. He's a side character. Dickens often hid his commentary on social life in these side characters, and Winnick is amazing. You see, Winnick is a split man. He has two personalities that are in complete contradiction to one another. One of them is at the office, cold, deliberate, calculating, incapable of anything like human feeling. And the other, Pip, the main character, meets at his home. 
warm, whimsical even. He, he puts a cannon on his house so that he can fire it every day to declare that he's home. He takes care of his aged parents. He is courting this beautiful young woman. It's bizarre. One day, uh, Pip goes to him for advice. They've built this friendship over the course of the book. And, and Pip goes to his friend looking for advice. And he is met, he's rebuffed with this cold and harsh criticism. Don't waste your time. Don't waste my time. Pip says later, reflecting upon the moment, he says, I realized in that moment that they were two Wemmicks, and this was the wrong one. Now, Wemmick is an absurd character. He's a humorous character. He's, he's a tragic character. The reason I bring him up is because there's a way in we all live a little bit like women. We all live torn between these different categories, these different domains that we want to live in. And wouldn't it be nice if they all stayed in their boxes? We all stayed, if I had my business self over here and my family self over here, and, and then the part of me that likes to kayak or likes to fish over here, and they could all coexist, but they won't. You start a job. It's a dream job. You work nine to five at the dream job and everything is going great, but sooner or later, the boss would like to see some commitment. What does that mean? Well, it means staying a little later. It means working the weekends, maybe the holidays. And that thing after thing happens, the next thing you know, you're working on vacation and the children are wondering where you are. Maybe for you though, that's not, that's not an issue. You're fine with telling work where to stop. The thing for you is you want peace. I just want to not feel anxious or stressed. Life can be overwhelming. I just need a break. And so you, what? You, you have a couple drinks at the end of the day. You find a way to entertain yourself. You, you do something, but you're not even enjoying the thing you're doing. All it's doing is keeping you from worrying. But here's the problem. Life requires worrying. Isn't that the cruel reality? Life requires stress. If you want a relationship one day, you want a connection with somebody, you want to achieve some of your goals or dreams, all of those things are going to require you to step into stress. And so if I keep chasing this internal peace, this internal well-being of everything's under control, I have to lose out on these other things. They won't coexist side by side. In the 20th century, there was a German sociologist named Max Weber. He described it this way. He said, the plight of modern man is that you live your life according to these different and competing spheres or domains. And each of them has their own logic, their own rules of conduct, and their own, I thought this was fascinating, Weber said this, their own God. Each of these domains has its own good towards which all of your actions must be directed. The plight of modern humanity is trying to satisfy them all. To give our business opinions at the office, our family opinions with the family, our religious opinions at church. To keep them all like a waiter with too many tables, running back and forth, back and forth, trying to keep everyone satisfied and everyone happy. And the problem is that they won't be. <coughs> The problem is that all of your competing gods will not be satisfied with anything less than your full allegiance. This is what Jesus said, right? He said, he said it best. He said, you can't serve two masters. He didn't say you shouldn't serve two masters. He didn't say, listen, I don't advise serving two masters. He said, you cannot do it. It will destroy you. At one point or another, if you want to live a life, right? If you want to flourish as a human, you're going to have to pick a master. You're going to have to serve one. You're going to have to let go of the other. If you're going to have a coherent life, you're going to have to choose to decide which one of these gods you'll live for, or else you're going to tear yourself apart. Now, that choosing, that making a decision, Committing to a way of life, committing to a path, saying this is where I'm going, that is what the Bible means by faith. That is what the Bible means by belief. Some of you, I think, maybe grew up, I, it's possible I grew up this way, you, you think that faith is something your tummy does. 
right? So when we say faith, we mean, listen, you've just got to believe in yourself. You've, you've got to have more faith. Listen, just really think on the bright side. Be positive and things will turn out okay. That faith becomes somehow synonymous with wishful thinking. That's not what faith is. When the Bible talks about faith, it's not asking you to think hopefully about things, to, to think wishfully about things. When the Bible talks about faith or belief in the Bible, it's the same word. It's talking about making a decision. It's talking about committing to who you are going to serve. It's talking about making a commitment about the path that you're going to follow. And that is a whole person decision. It's your motivation. It's your desire. Yes, it's your hopes. It's your dreams. It's also your reason, your rationality, your thinking self. All brought to bear on how you are going to live your life. Christ says, if you want to be my disciple, you have to commit everything to this goal. You can't do it halfway. I refuse to be one of the pantheon of your gods competing for your allegiance. It won't work. You have to make a decision. Our passage today, our gospel passage, is all about belief. It's all about making that decision. John says at the end of the gospel, all of this was written so that you might believe, and in believing, you might actually have life. But how could I possibly make a decision like that? Let's say you agree. You agree that you want a life of wholeness, you want a life of flourishing. You're tired of being shipwrecked in a sea of competing gods, each claiming the right to consume you. How can you possibly make the kind of commitment that is being called for here? You might say, I have all of these parts of me, my reason, my desires, my fears, my dreams. That's why I have all of these competing goals. I want a good and successful life, so I chase this goal of work. I want a family that's nurturing and life-giving, and so I chase this goal of family. I'm torn because I have all of these parts of me. To cash in all of it on a single option, how could I ever justify that? But how could you justify not making a decision? You only have the illusion of choice. In the Gospel today, we have a story. We have the story of St. Thomas. And that story serves as a kind of model for what it means to come to believe. Of what it would be like for me to have what I needed to make this kind of decision. I want to look at St. Thomas's process today. As we walk through it, I want you to look at it from the perspective of what is it like for a mind that's wrestling with what would I need in order to believe? So we look at St. Thomas together. It says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my fingers into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. The first thing I want you to notice is that Thomas doubts. That's his moniker, right? We call him Doubting Thomas. But I don't want you to miss the really important detail here with the familiarity. Thomas doubts. Thomas has questions. Thomas assumes, this is critical, Thomas assumes that his faith, what he commits himself to, should correspond with reality. He will not accept a fiction as reality. Thomas is not interested in a spiritual resurrection of Christ. He's only interested if there's an actual resurrection of Christ. He's not interested in a story that makes him feel all warm inside. He says, I, don't, I won't do that. Unless it's real, I don't want it. Here's what I want you to recognize. In this expectation, and expecting that his faith correspond to reality, Thomas is fully in line with the teachings of Scripture. The teaching of Scripture has never been that there are spiritual, spiritual truths that contradict reality, but we just hold on to them anyway. The teaching of Scripture has always been, from beginning to end, that God is the source of reality, and that the life of faithfulness to God is the only frame within the world which the world truly makes sense. What does the psalm we read earlier today say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? 
wisdom, not fanciful thinking, not folly. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now here's something to think about. Thomas, as a good Jewish boy, would have grown up hearing this psalm sung over and over and over again. It had made it into his DNA. The fear of the Lord, the the life lived rightly in relationship to God, is one that produces wisdom. Thomas would have remembered this psalm. He would have remembered and likely been made to memorize the book of Proverbs, which says, according to wisdom, according to rationality, God laid the foundations of the world. The world is knowable. How do we pursue science? We pursue it with the confidence that you can know something about the world. Because God made the world according to wisdom. And Thomas would have remembered the teaching of Deuteronomy. That says if someone comes to you and says, hey, I'm a prophet. Here's what God's going to do. And it doesn't happen. Do you know what you do? You stone them because they're a liar. God says, listen, if a prophet comes and what he says is going to happen doesn't happen, don't say, well, maybe he meant it in a spiritual sense. No, don't say, well, it was a good story. No, you reject his teaching. Faith has to correspond to reality, or else it's not faith. It's not worth holding. Father Daniel preached last week on the believability of the resurrection, that the resurrection is intellectually credible and existentially satisfying. If you missed that sermon, I would strongly encourage you to go back and listen to it it again, or listen to it. If you were here last week, I would encourage you to listen to it again, and I would encourage you to ask yourself, do I actually believe that? Do I believe that the resurrection is intellectually coherent, or am I just closing my eyes and trying not to think about it too long? Brothers and sisters, if your answer is the latter, I would gently encourage you that that's not an act of faith. Faith is believing the Christ who said, I am the truth. And you will never be able to make that complete, wholehearted decision if you're checking your brain at the door. If you're allowing parts of yourself to run off in disbelief. If you're saying, well, I just won't test it. I just won't seek. I won't look for answers because I've decided ahead of time that God doesn't have answers. That's not an act of faith. Faith says, I know that my God speaks the truth. And therefore, I'm not afraid to investigate. I'm not afraid of inquiry. No, Saint Thomas, the Apostle Thomas, expected his faith to correspond to reality. And he asked questions. Now, here's the other thing I want you to notice. He asked questions. Where does he ask questions? He asks them within the community. We can tell at this point, by the way, that Thomas is not a good southerner, right? None of you have ever come, actually, it happened one time, but almost none of you have ever come up to me after a service and say, hey, that didn't make any sense. (laughs) We also thought of it was great time. I'm a good (laughs) watch. Thomas is, where is he? What is it? It's the eighth day, which means it's Sunday. Right, John is doing this deliberately, by the way. He's telling him, this is a church service. Thomas is at church with the apostles, and he's pushing back. They're saying, Thomas, look at what we've seen. He's saying, I don't believe it. I've got questions. He's asking them within the community. But this is really important. He's gathered with the people who know him and love him. He's gathered with the people that he has spent the last three years of, years with. You know, we have this romantic idea. I don't mean it's lovely. I mean, it comes out of romanticism. We have this romantic idea that somehow you're going to settle the biggest questions of life by going off on your own and figuring it out. But y'all, this doesn't make any sense. When, when Maylin and I are raising our children, we're educating them, do we send them off into the woods? All right, children, have fun, discover calculus. Uh, it doesn't work. What if I've got questions about Pearl Harbor? What if I've got questions about, did that happen? What happened there? Do I go off and try to discover it myself? No. I ask people who were there. Or I go and I find an expert and I read his analysis of all the facts who make sense to me of how I would interpret all the data. Here you go. This is what it is. We don't don't come to these things ourselves, and that's not a bad thing. 
It doesn't make you inauthentic to believe in community, to listen to the community, to bring your questions to the community. Now listen, I'm, I'm being a little flippant. I think the real reason that you don't bring your questions to the community, assuming that you're allowing yourself to ask the good questions, the reason you won't bring your questions to the community is that you're afraid that you'll either be dismissed or you'll be consumed. You're afraid that you'll either be dismissed, you'll be, you'll be met with a rejection. Don't come to me asking that question. Or you'll be consumed in a kind of brainwashed group thing. But here's the great paradox of life. To know anything, even to know yourself, requires community. Are there bad communities? Absolutely. Are there places that consume you, that will, con uh, will seek to control and say, don't ask questions, just get, in bo get on board with everything we're saying? Yeah, those exist. But the decision there is not between being in community or being out of community. It's just like relationships. Are there bad relationships? Yes. That doesn't mean that we reject relationships altogether. We have to have them. You were all born into a relationship. I know that you all have relationships because you're here, you're alive. What happens to a child that's raised without relationships? We know this psychologically. They don't make it. You have to have people. The decision is not between, do I bring my questions to the community or I figure them out on my own? The question is, do I look for a good community that will love me and point me towards truth? That won't seek to coerce me or to say, you can't ask the questions. Thomas has found a community that doesn't throw him out for asking questions, but instead patiently reiterates to him the truth. So we find Thomas doubting, expecting his faith to correspond to reality, and asking questions of the community. But then something happens. What is it? Thomas has an encounter with the risen Lord. Thomas is here asking questions. He's here in the community. And then he has an encounter with the risen Lord. Here's what the text says. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. He says, peace be with you. He doesn't say, how dare you, Thomas. He says, peace be with you. It's important. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not believe, do not disbelieve, but believe. And then Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Now this happened rapidly. And that's the way that life always happens when you're looking from the outside, right? You go back and talk to someone, why did you make that decision? All of a sudden you realize there was this infinite amount of time in between those two points. All of these different things converge at once. What happens to Thomas in that moment that moves him from doubting to commitment? There's something that happens that pushes him past the line where he says, I'm in. What is it? Well, there are two things I think that happen. Thomas sees something and he hears something. Thomas sees something and he hears something that together changed the course of his life. So what does Thomas see? Here's the thing you have to remember about Thomas. Thomas was one of the disciples, right? Thomas had spent the last three years traveling around with Judea, with the Lord, listening to his teaching and witnessing miracles. You have to reset your scale a little bit, okay? Because Thomas believes in miracles. He spent three years watching them happen. But Thomas was also a Jew living under Roman control. And by this point in Jewish history, there was a script for would-be messiahs that got killed. Here's how it went. A messiah, this happened over and over again. Y'all know this, right? Jesus is not the first one in Judea claiming to be the messiah. You have any number of pretenders, any number of pretenders after Jesus. They rise up, they gain a following, they charge into Jerusalem, and what happens? The Romans kill them. And the people scatter, and that's the end of it. They rise up, they gain a following, they charge into Jerusalem, and the Romans kill them people scattered. The year after Jesus was born, there was an uprising in Galilee. The Romans crucified 2,000 men along the streets of Judea. Rise up, the Romans put you down. That's the end. We don't talk about it anymore. 
we don't do it anymore. This was the script that Thomas expected. Thomas isn't going to be taken in. He knows the script too well already. He says, I will not be made a fool of. I feel foolish. I've, I've put everything behind this beside. I've followed him for three years across the Jewish countryside. I'm not going to believe. Jesus has played his part and lost. But what happens when Christ appears before Thomas is that all of a sudden, a different script comes into play. All of a sudden, Thomas begins to understand things according to a different frame. One that Jesus had been trying to teach them from the beginning. When Christ appeared before Thomas with a hole in his side and scars on his head, I think that everything Christ ever said played back through Thomas' mind like a montage. All of a sudden, it clicked. And I've got a reason for thinking that. We'll get to it in a moment. But what I want you to understand is that when Thomas saw Jesus standing up, having been killed, having been slaughtered, he saw him standing, he realized he needed a different frame. I think when he saw Jesus standing before the crowd, he said, he remembered, or when he saw Jesus standing, he remembered Jesus standing before the crowd saying, I am the good shepherd. I will lay down my life for the sheep and I will take it up again. I think that when Thomas saw Jesus standing in front of him, he heard and knew Jesus' teaching. Jesus had told him, he said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am he. And I think that Thomas, and we know that Thomas was here for this because he's in the story. I think Thomas remembered the death of Lazarus. Do you remember what happened? Martha, Lazarus' sister, had sent a message to Jesus. Jesus, Lazarus is dying. You have to come help him. But everyone had agreed if Jesus goes back that close to Jerusalem, they're going to kill him. Jesus eventually says, Come on, let's go. And Thomas, eager Thomas, Thomas that wanted to believe, jumps up and says, let's go and die with him. And Thomas comes to Bethany with Jesus, and he hears Jesus say something to Martha that must have puzzled him immensely at the time. Jesus said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And in this moment, when Thomas is looking at Jesus, he's looking at the scars, he's looking at the holes in his side, all of a sudden he remembers, he understood that this was the same voice, the same voice that had spoken to Moses so many centuries ago, that had said, when Moses said, what do I call you? He said, you call me I am that I am. This is who I am. I am the only one who is. Thomas knew in that moment that he was looking at the Lord of life and death, that he was looking at God. So Thomas sees and realizes that he's looking at God, but he also hears something. And this is really important because data is not enough, right? All of the evidence in the world is not enough. There's something else that we need before we're willing to believe in something, before I'm willing to throw my life behind something. What does Thomas hear? He hears Jesus say, Thomas, put your finger here. Take your hand, put it into my side. Thomas hears his own words brought back to him. The words he had said, not to Jesus, but to the apostles, he hears those words come back. His own words, his own fears, his own doubts, not thrown in his face, but met with the love of the good shepherd who had told Thomas, I will not lose my sheep. He said, every one that the Father has given me, I will not lose. I will find them and keep them. Christ is speaking to Thomas. He's saying, Thomas, I know you, and I've come out to find you. You know, we were talking about all of these different gods, all these different ways that I can live my life, right? All, all of the different ways that I can chase after the good life. But you know the thing about all of those gods? They all demand that you come and find them, that you consume yourself in the pursuit of them. 
and then they might accept you. Commit yourself to the God of money. And what does that mean? It means that you work overtime every night. You skip your vacations. You diversify your investments. You give your entire self to making money so that maybe one day, at the end of the day, you might have a kind of peace. Commit yourself to the God of having the perfect family, being the perfect parents, and all you attend all the soccer games. You provide all of the enrichment activities, all the piano and violin and bridge lessons and everything else. You do all of the things with the hope that maybe, just maybe one day when the kids are grown, they'll still talk to you. <laughs> Each of the God, it doesn't matter. You can, institutional religion or everyday mundane gods. It doesn't matter. All of them say, give yourself over completely to this and then maybe you'll get a reward. Christianity is the only religion where God says, I have come to find you. In the midst of your doubt, in the midst even of your doing wrong, I have pursued you, and I have given you my very self. I'm not consuming you. I'm giving you my very self for your consumption. I'm giving you my very life. The philosopher Jamie Smith says it this way, he says, Jesus is the shout of God. God coming out to meet you on the road. What Thomas hears and what Thomas finally knows is that the wounds he sees on Christ's hands and feet, the hole in his side, were all the actions of a God who says, I have come out to find you. And in that moment, Thomas makes his decision. In that moment, he says, my Lord and my God. Now, here's the thing. Almost all of the commentators on this passage agree. The way the story is told, Thomas doesn't actually follow through with examining Christ's son. He drops it. He doesn't keep poking and prodding. He drops it. At this moment, he has decided that he has had enough. That he knows enough. Here's the thing about belief and the thing about doubting. At some point, you have to decide that you have enough data to move forward. At some point, you have to make a decision. And this isn't a religious thing. This is how thinking works. Um, David Hume, the, the famous atheist skeptic from the Scottish Enlightenment. This guy hated Christianity, by the way. But you know what he said? He said, be a philosopher but be still a man. Charles Peirce, the founder of American pragmatism, said the only reason we ever think about anything, the only reason that we ever deliberate about the truth is so that we can figure out how we ought to act. That's pragmatism for you, right? There will always be more and more possibilities of questions. Do I really know? Do I really know that this person loves me? Do I really know that, that this table is real? Well, maybe it's fiction. Maybe it's a, it's a mirage. Maybe, maybe that love is actually some sort of deception. At some point, you have to decide to move forward. That's the way that life works. You have doubts. That's good. Wrestle with those. But don't let your wrestling become an excuse for inaction. Christ has offered you a way of life that is capable of supporting your questions and satisfying your needs. More importantly, though, it is a path in which God himself has come out to meet you and give you life. The question being asked, the only question being asked, the only question that will ever matter is, do you believe him? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, 
God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten God made, of one being with the Father, who through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our for Foley, our Archbishop and Bishop, Frank, our Assistant Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese, for our congregation, and for the upcoming selection in June of the next Archbishop for the Anglican Church in North America. Lord, in your mercy, for our brothers and sisters in Christ here in the Athens area and for the many campus ministries. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, for our nation, for those in authority and for all in public service. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who departed this life in a certain hope to the resurrection and thanksgiving. Let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us humbly confess our sins, Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you in our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and in true faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Much to stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. We exchange signs of God's peace with one another.
All right, you may be seated. Uh, if you need an announcement before you the communion table, and a reminder that uh, we've been having family worship services here the last uh, few weeks, and next week is our first Sunday with our full St. Thomas kids, which means during the peace parents, if you've got an elementary schooler, you'll be able to go out and use the safety tag and check them out to the elementary and bring back in for uh, most of the service as we gather for communion together. Uh, but just a few things first. Uh, welcome. It's good to be with you today on the second Sunday of Easter, uh, our third Sunday here in this space. Uh, thank you for, again, everyone who has helped us transition uh, to here. I realize between Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter, um, we had 81 different people uh, serve on one of our volunteer teams, some of them on multiple teams. And it was just a reminder that a few years ago, we didn't have 81 people in the church. Um, and so thanks be to God for what he is doing uh, in our midst and through his people. Thank you for everyone uh, who's been leaning in to serve as we uh, move in and do this work together uh, that God has given us to do. Uh, a few things as we come to the Easter season that are happening uh, during the week, just want to make you aware of. Uh, the first is we're doing a lot of things here ready for our bishop's visit on May 12th. Uh, that's Ascension Sunday during the Easter season, and we've got confirmation, baptisms, and membership welcome all on that Sunday, May 12th. And so there's some prep running up to each of those. Um, one is our confirmation class is going to start this Tuesday at 6 p.m. Uh, that'll be at the St. Thomas Parish House, and we'll meet uh, April 9th through April 30th to prepare for that. I'm looking forward to, to teaching that and um, those who are ready and eager to be confirmed or received into the Anglican Church. Um, if you've got questions on that, uh, do send me an email, um, and I'll probably get to it Tuesday. So uh, if you send it today, I'll try to get to it Tuesday. Our team is starting to take Mondays off uh, as a staff team, uh, just to establish a rhythm for that, which is good. Um, also, baptisms on May 12th. If you would like to be baptized, um, or if you have a child who is ready to be baptized, make sure to reach out to Father Bill. He'll get everything you need to know for that. And then in terms of membership, some of you guys have already done our St. Thomas 101 and you um, are praying and exploring, is this where God would call uh, you to be a part of this community? Um, and so if you're going through that process, uh, let us know how we can help and pray for you in that. We'll also have uh, an additional St. Thomas 101 class on uh, May 5th. We'll have that as a lunch. Um, after our normal service, you can get in touch with, uh, you can text about that, and we'll send out some information soon where you can sign up online for that as well. Um, I think that's it. Uh, if you are a guest, a visitor, thank you so much for being here. If you'd like to, there is a welcome table. You can fill out your name, email address. I will put you on our newsletter distribution list, um, and hopefully we'll get you in the loop on things. Um, I do know, by the way, this is super random, but if you have a Gmail account, um, our, our server's been dropping emails to you. So if you're like, hey, we haven't heard from you in a while, that's what's going on. We're working on getting that fixed this week. But there's some IT stuff I don't understand making that happen. So, um, oh, yeah, good call from, from Father Bill. We do have a community group of our teenagers, our youth that meet on Sunday nights. And uh, that's been off for Holy Week and Easter. That will resume next Sunday. Uh, we do a lot of our youth for offer spring breaks. So that won't meet tonight, but we'll resume next Sunday. Uh, reach out to Father Bill with any questions on that. All right, I'll invite our ushers to come forward now to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Um, as we do, we remember the words of the Lord Jesus, who himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. <laughs>
Lord be with you. With your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. And it is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was offered for us and has taken away the sin of the world, who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven who forever sing this sin to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy subject to evil and death, you and your mercy, sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. The night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament to be made one body with him, and that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
a word of instruction as we come to the communion table this morning. You also see um, instructions on the inside cover of the bulletin. But if you'd like to receive this morning, the usher will release you row by row. Uh, be, this side of the room will come this way. This side of the room will come right here. Uh, if you'll come and open your hands to receive. Uh, one of myself or Father Bill will put, place the bread in your hands. Um, you can then at that point consume the bread and drink from the chalice of wine. Um, or you can take the bread, dip it carefully into the wine, and consume the communion elements together. Um, this meal is open to all who are baptized and seeking to follow the Lord. And you don't have to be an Anglican or a member of St. Thomas, but if you are baptized and seeking to follow uh, the Lord, this meal is for you. And He is here uh, to meet with us this morning. Um, if for any reason you're not receiving communion this morning, um, you're welcome to remain in your pew and use this time for reflection, meditation. Also, if you'd like to come forward uh, for a brief prayer of blessing, you can do that. And just come forward, uh, cross your arms over your chest to signal uh, myself or Bill uh, to pray that short prayer of blessing uh, over you. Uh, we do have gluten-free wafers available. Just let us know if you need that when you do come forward. And on each side, after you either come forward and receive, uh, or if you want to go to them um, uh, when you come forward, there are prayer teams available. And so if there's something this morning, that you'd like to receive prayer for and we can pray along with you about. If there's something in the sermon that you thought about uh, your own settled faith in the risen Jesus or the questions that you might have, we would love to pray with you this morning um, about that. Uh, but friends, come taste and see that the Lord is good.
pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, and remain with you always. Amen. Let's sing our recessional hymn together.